Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. How are you doing? I hope you've had an amazing week, an amazing couple of weeks. So what have you been up to? Anything exciting? How's your wellbeing been? Have you been uh, getting back into having some treatments and massage? Hooray! We're so delighted that we can we can uh, go back and see our, uh, our lovely therapists. I've really missed all my uh massage and regular treatments that i've had and uh, oh i'm oh i just needed someone to rub my shoulders and i've uh, i've been really really delighted to have been able to get in and see my massage therapist over the last couple of weeks it's been amazing and speaking of amazing i have a fantastic guest for you tonight I've got the lovely uh, James Gopala from Harrogate, my hometown actually, that's where I was born, Harrogate. And uh, James is a really, really incredibly interesting guy. He's, he's a spiritual teacher, he's, he's a leader in, in his uh, field, and he's, he's got so much to share with us today. I'm hoping that we'll get to get some gems of wisdom from him in uh, tonight's interview. So James actually spent f over five years studying and training out in India. He was out there from 2007 to about 2012, where he completed his master's degree in Indian philosophy and religion in the holy city of Varanasi. I hope I've said that right. That's very nasty, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> James is a qualified Shivananda Hatha Yoga and Ashtanga Yoga teacher. I'm not sure I pronounced those correctly either, but I'll get him to correct me if I haven't. Hey, he's putting his thumbs up at me. That sounds good. That looks good. <laughs> he's also trained in Trika. Uh, that's the school of Tantra Yoga, Ooh. and has taken extensive, well, an extensive personal time of retreat and immersion into those esoteric teachings of the Tantric philosophy um, of Kashmir. Uh, Sh I want to say shamanism or shavanism. <laughs> shavanism, yeah, that's it. Shavanism. He yeah. teaches yoga and Pilates at the Yorkshire Centre for Wellbeing in Harrogate, uh, and I believe they just won some awards for being like top wellbeing centre in the area. We did, uh, yes. Very happy about that. So yeah, it's very, great very well deserved. Your centre you. is fantastic. Um, James integrates the teachings of Tantra into his yoga classes, working with the psychosomatic connection for healing. And he really focuses on uh, chakras and uh, that self-inquiry, self, self kind of going in and, and really connecting with that sense of self and uh, deep healing, um, as well as about a million other things, James. Welcome to the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to be here. Really excited for this conversation. Oh, my goodness. India for uh, your kind of educational uh, period of time, a time of learning, a kind, a time of study, and a time of growth as well. Tell us a little bit about what must have been an incredible time in your life uh, when you were in India. Yeah, definitely. I mean, basically, in my teenage years, I started to have spiritual experiences, mystical experiences. So, starting to wake up spiritually early on. This then led me to a year in Africa as a gap year. And again, I had some really powerful, kind of almost like biblically spiritual experiences there that completely that experience in Africa changed the path of my life. Uh, I went then to university 
and studied biology and anthropology in Durham, but I had this kind of conflict, inner conflict. I had to had all these questions, metaphysical questions, philosophical questions. And up until then, I only really had Christianity as the framework to connect to spirituality. And it got me so far, and it was within a Christian context that I started to wake up um, to something more than just the physical. But it was when I was at university, I started to read uh, Buddhism, attend Buddhist society, start to get into quantum physics. And during that time, I just knew I had to go to India. Uh, it was just an intuitive, innate knowing. So just after university, before I turned 24, I was like, right, I'm going to take a one-way ticket to India, and I want to have some money saved in my bank. So I worked for a year and a half after university, and I just took a one-way ticket to India without any real understanding of you know what I was going to do there or any expectation I just was like right I'm just going and I end up st spending five years there and it led me to Varanasi which is the holy city in the north of India did just I say it right Varanasi that's it yeah yeah oh yeah that's it so Varanasi is actually the oldest inhabited city on the planet it's a very ancient city and it's where the Hindus go when they die and they're cremated. So you have all these wow. burning gats along the river. It's very powerful. You go and you can see this. It's open to the public. You see the bodies taken down, put on the pyres. You, you know, you can see all of this. And then, and then the remains are put into the river. So it's a very powerful city. It's known as Shiva City. It's, it's got a, quite an abrasive, a fiery energy. And, mm. But the university is very beautiful, very green and open. Uh, and it's Varanasi is an ancient center of learning of uh, philosophy and music. So I had, after traveling around and doing some teaching, I was teaching to better monks in, in the Himalayas and helping uh, village women in the south of India at an NGO. I then settled at university and studied there for three years and I had um, a, an incredible time. It was, you know, I just ch changed. I guess my personality changed, my life's focus changed. I became very dedicated and focused on the spiritual path, the path of yoga, the path of philosophy, the path of self-inquiry, the path of Ayurveda, which is Indian traditional medicine, so looking at the health side of things. And it completely, it was a very, very transformational time and it really expanded uh, on many levels. So I've, I've have uh, chatted with you a little bit in the past about Ayurveda and the work that you do with um, your, your kind of the not your knowledge of Ayurvedic medicine and that's really fascinating stuff but I'm really interested uh, tonight to chat with you more about yoga um yoga is something that I've been doing quite a lot of uh, during the lockdown time because I've had time and the space to do it and uh, I've been really missing my massage so I found that the some of the stretches and the moves were really 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 beneficial um, but when I think of yoga I think of skinny, stretchy women wearing fabulously brightly coloured lycra. And uh, I'm not a lycra wearing kind of girl, really. You're not? <laughs> Definitely not. That's a nice pink lycra. Luminous yellow. <laughs> a, bit, a bit of luminous, a bit of luminous lycra. I think I'd definitely get, you know, scare a few people away if I started walking around in that kind of... Uh, uh, outfit and and I've always kind of felt a little bit that yoga is not for me because I'm a person who's perhaps on the bigger side in terms of my shape and my size and uh, you know I don't know how bendy I am I'm not sure I can get into contort my body into some of these weird positions and it's always been something that I've um, kind of thought is not really for me and maybe yoga classes might be something a bit kind of scary but what I've really learned um, is just how yoga is really about a personal journey, isn't it? Mm. And and you, the way that you teach yoga is about really inviting people onto that spiritual path um, that yoga can really help to drive you and move you, you, you forward on. Tell me a little bit more about the spiritual path of yoga. Yeah, that's, that's great, everything you said there. I think in the West, yoga has been adopted as a physical exercise, by and large, you know, and um, it has a reputation of, um, yeah, sort of women, young women in the lycra, you know, in the gyms and things <laughs> like that. Uh, and the physical side of yoga is obviously important, but yoga traditionally 
has been the spiritual path to enlightenment. So yoga is one of the six orthodox schools of Indian philosophy. It's the yoga sutras of Patanjali, which is a system to enlightenment, essentially. And typically we know these eight steps of yoga. You go through these eight stages. And the final stage is the, the meditation called samadhi. And when we do samadhi enough, the mind is silent. It, the, it works with the subconscious and it actually replaces all the painful memories and traumas are replaced by this very peaceful, we call it sanskara, it's an impression. So the impression of the past trauma is replaced by the impression of deep, peaceful meditation. So that's the traditional um, system of yoga, so 500 BC by this guy called Patanjali. Um, and again, you have the eight steps. And asana, posture, is only the third step out of eight. So, okay. yeah, so again... So it's it, quite a misconception that yoga is for skinny, lycra-clad young women. It's actually, it's actually, there, there's so much more to it, isn't there? And, and did you say there was eight, eight steps? So you have eight steps of yoga. So the first two, yama and niyama, they're just kind of almost like the rules, the guidelines that you can adhere to. Don't steal, don't kill, you know, practice cleanliness. These kind of based like the Ten Commandments kind of thing, just to give the guidelines. Okay. The third step is asana, posture. And traditionally, asana, posture, is simply to make the body healthy so you can sit for long periods of time in meditation. The fourth stage is pranayama, which is the breathing practices. And the goal of pranayama is to balance the energy in the body. Recognize that in yoga, one of the main focuses is balancing breath and the mind. If the breath is irregular, shallow, uh, rapid, the mind is also gonna be under stress. So as you control and manage your breathing, the mind automatically calms down. So once we've got the body healthy, we can then focus on the breathing. From there, we're ready to sit in a sort of meditation and we go into pratyahara, where we internalize our focus. We stop being so distracted by the external world and we start to turn inwards and just check in with ourselves, how we feeling. And even in the traditional system, these first five steps are not even considered to be real yoga. It's more like a superficial form of yoga. And then you've got the last three, which you have dana, which is concentrating the mind. Then you have meditation, number seven, jhan. And then you have samadhi, absorption. And basically, those stages kind of all merge into one, where you're quieting the mind, you're focusing the mind, and eventually the mind stops chattering, and you go into a still, silent mind. And so traditionally, the goal of yoga is to, to quieten the mind. Yoga chitta vritti naroda, as it says, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Um, so traditionally, and even now with Hatha Yoga, which is a much more recent development of the traditional yoga, the goal is this mastery and stillness and expansion of the mind. And the body is something that we want to be healthy and strong so we can sit at it for long periods of time but the the goal is not the body and making the body all beautiful okay and that's that's the fixation in the west has become completely fixated on this third step of yoga it's all about looking body beautiful and doing all these fancy postures but often you find there's a lot of ego kind of associated with that oh, look how good i look and look at what kind of positions <laughs> i can do when it's really lost the the essence and the heart of, of yoga beautiful it does put it puts me off a little bit when i see you know our sandra advertising her a yoga class on a friday night and she's like standing on her hands with her legs in some kind of weird position i think well i'm not going to be able to do that so maybe sandra love that class is not for me i really love the idea that it's it's a whole it's like a whole way of living isn't it don't kill anyone very good idea not to kill anyone you know have a clean body keep your body healthy and, and that's the kind of the exercise element of it but that just seems like really small when you explain it it's like a really small part of it is about those crazy um wonderful positions that people can get their bodies into but then you've got this whole um 
internal healing and development kind of way of living that uh, yoga really provides. Um, and then the Hatha yoga, that's the kind of yoga that I hear most, uh, you know, hear about most in, in, in my area, um, Hatha yoga classes. Um, and there's a couple of other different types of yoga, like yoga nidra, I think is like sleep yoga and how there are so many different types of yoga um but you have this real love and passion to bring tantra into your teaching and i have to say whenever i think about tantra i always think about sexy sexy things sexy sexy tantra tantra oh isn't that all about like getting it on in in a, in the best way possible <laughs> that might be part of it but certainly not the essence of it it's all about the romance and the sexy, sexy loveliness. I, it was probably just another misconception that I have. But what is what is Tantra? It's a good point that you bring up because when we hear the word Tantra, it's either in the East they think it's black magic and in the West it's just associated with, with sex. Tantra is essentially a system of a spiritual path. It's a system of, of a, a mystical practice that is ancient and from the east and it became more prevalent in the first millennium AD in India it became more widely practiced and Hatha yoga is a tantric practice so uh -huh. essentially what we're doing certainly if we're practicing Hatha yoga and maybe working more with the chakras and mantras and visualizations and meditation essentially it's tantra so if we look, what, well, what is Tantra? What's the definition of Tantra? In some ways, Tantra literally means warp or loom, or thread. And it's this idea of this uh, threading of consciousness, infinite consciousness that permeates all of reality. That's a little bit abstract. The, the definition that I like to work with is the, based on the two verbs of Tantra, tanoti and triati. And tanoti means the uh, expansion of energy, essentially. And trati is the uh, liberation of, um, sorry, expansion of consciousness, triati, mm. and tanoti, the liberation of energy. So essentially, tantra is a practice that works with the body, it embraces the body, and it works with um, different practices where you like yogic practices, but also working with mantra. And sex is a small part of it, but there are different practices that are designed to expand your consciousness. Okay, and in, in India, you have a more orthodox system and the non orthodox. So, orthodox sees the body as an obstacle, and the very, it's like the original Vedic Brahmanistic tradition, like the traditional. Indian religions, they have the caste system and the priests at the, the top of the caste, the Brahmins, and they manage all like the rituals and they control essentially the, the, the religion. And it's all about purity and the world is seen as an obstacle, the body is an obstacle and making sure they maintain purity. They don't touch people from lower castes. You know, there's this kind of separation and this real sense of and morality and ethics and, and purity and cleanliness. Tantra is the opposite to that. Tantra embraces life, it embraces the body, it embraces uh, all things in life. So there are certain practices in, in Tantra where things like sex is embraced as ways to awaken the energy in the body. Also, you know, you might eat meat or drink alcohol, certain sects. And also go more extreme where you have certain tantricas that will do their practice on uh, funeral grounds. Literally, there'll be, like you're describing Varanasi, where there'll be on these, uh, these funeral grounds with the dead bodies and they might sit and meditate on a dead body and even eat the flesh of dead bodies. A certain wow. sects of tantra do do that. <laughs> and the whole point of it is, is to break down all these taboos and all these social norms and social social constructions that say this is right and this is wrong so and that's an extreme example but basically tantra is saying well the only thing that's impure are the negative destructive thoughts and emotions we experience but actually because everything is an expression of divinity 
everything mm. is divine everything is shakti the divine feminine creation spirit great spirit and so everything therefore can be seen as as divine so tantra is essentially a spiritual pathway that embraces life embraces the body embraces yoga practices embraces mantra and there are many different schools of tantra so some they may be completely ascetic and practice brahmacharya which is celibacy some may embrace you know um sexual ritual and things like that um some focus more on mantra and the physical practice like hatha yoga so and also that the, the qualities of of tantra traditionally is there's a guru there's initiation you do rituals yeah and there's guidelines you do physical practice and there's guidelines for living your life and so any time, even if you burn a candle and burn incense and maybe have an image of a deity or something or, you know, anything that means something to you, that is a form of Tantra because it works with puja, with rituals. Um, but again, there are different schools uh, of Tantra and the, the school that you mentioned, Kashmir Shaivism, originating from Kashmir is a, a school that I did a lot of um, retreats with and I studied with Bettina, Bettina Obama. She's the direct from the she's a dis disciple of the last living master of Swami Lakshmanju um, and it, she's from Varanasi and she's uh, Austrian by birth and you know we did many retreats and we studied some of these incredible texts so basically when I was in India we were studying the different traditions I came across these tantric traditions specifically mm -hmm. Kashmir Shaivism and having a deep interest in philosophy realized actually the philosophy the metaphysics of these tantric schools was spot on, was perfect. Whereas some of the other schools, uh, you know, maybe not quite on point, or they have some good things, but it's not holistic. So mm -hmm. the tantric understanding tantra, and then also recognizing hatha yoga is tantric. Mm. Um, it is, I think, very important when, as a teacher, you start to teach yoga, recognizing it has these deep spiritual. Um, it originates from this, this spiritual tradition and it's not just about you know keeping the body flexible and strong and healthy mm. i had no idea that uh, that uh, some some of these uh, kind of more tantric uh based philosophies had eating dead bodies <laughs> yeah again not, very extreme I'm not, example <laughs> i'm not sure i can get my head around that one but um, <laughs> But there, there's definitely a lot of discomfort, isn't there, about around around sex and around around just our bodies and having acceptance of our bodies. And the, uh, there's some discomfort quite often about just being human and, and having human thoughts and feelings and responses and, you know, imperfections and all those sorts of things. And I guess... Um, that acceptance and that you know looking at the whole body the living physical body as well as the kind of more spiritual and kind of conscious side of things that kind of it does kind of go together um really well i can see it being really beneficial for people and you were saying how when you when you kind of step onto this path and you start doing uh, hatha yoga and really learning about about how to do it and living your life uh, following some of these guidelines and this philosophy it expands your consciousness how, how does how does um doing hatha yoga expand your consciousness tell us a little bit more about that expansion wow that's a good question so the goal or one of the results of doing hatha yoga so hatha yoga basically is a system that started again in the first millennium AD in, in India, but really became more widely accepted and practiced around fifth, the 15th century AD. And it was um, the, the Hatha Yoga Pradapika, the main text of Hatha Yoga was starting to be distributed. So Hatha Yoga in this text, that's when you first start to see the actual physical postures, because before then you didn't have text that actually showed all these different postures the standing postures and, and all these different postures you only really had the postures that we had with the meditation postures so hatha yoga the goal of hatha yoga essentially is to purify the body so it, it does recognize actually the importance of physical health and that again in the west is where we've just kind of fixated on but the purification of the body the mastery of the body making the body strong and flexible 
essentially leads you to what's called liar yoga, absorption, where your individual ego, your individual sense of self dissolves into the expansive consciousness of supreme reality, which we typically call Shiva. So when we talk about Shiva, we're not talking about a god, we're not talking about a religion, we're talking about a source, we're talking about pure consciousness, we're talking about great spirit, again, it has many, many names, but it's that infinite aspect of life, it is creation, but the, the, the consciousness, the foundation of creation. Now, in the Hatha Yoga uh, tradition is based on the tantric philosophy, and basically it states that everything is one unified consciousness. And we're starting to see in quantum physics, this concept of the uh, quantum field, or that things are all connected, and one thing and one part of the universe can instantly communicate with something, the other side of the universe is non-locality because everything is essentially one, ex one energy. So in the non-dualistic philosophies, of, of the East that recognizes that duality doesn't really exist. I.e. there's not separation between us and God. Everything is one expression, one reality, one consciousness. And our limited soul, the individual, is not different from the Shiva consciousness. In that respect, God is a state of consciousness god is a state of mind essentially so when we've purified the body and in hatha yoga you have different cleanses and bandhas and mudras so bandhas means lock and mudra means seal different ways we manipulate and move the energy in the body pranayama the breathing we're essentially preparing ourselves for some of these deeper meditation states. So the goal is the same essentially as the original Patanjali yoga, Samadhi, going into Samadhi, which they call Raja yoga, the yoga of kings. And it's essentially that place of um, absorption into infinite consciousness. Essentially what happens is in, the, in Hatha yoga, recognize that we hold trauma in the body and it's in the chakras so we work directly with the chakras and the chakras the trauma creates beliefs attitudes the way we perceive and define the world and that creates labels that creates limitations okay so based on our beliefs and the way we perceive the world we create a, a limited point of view and we don't see ourselves as this expansive shiva consciousness we just see ourselves as limited humans these evolved monkeys you know based on also what we've been programmed and conditioned by culture by science by society so essentially what we're doing in hatha yoga as we expand our consciousness we're essentially almost like weeds in the mind we're taking out these beliefs we're removing these traumas we're freeing up the energy again expansion of consciousness creates a freedom of energy back to that original uh, definition. And so the more we purify the body, we release energy from the body, we expand our mind. And the more we expand our consciousness, i.e. we let go of rigid beliefs and rigid attitudes and traumas and memories, we start to mm. purify that. And that expands our consciousness even more. So going from this very limited view of life and ourselves, it just starts to open and expand as we free up this energy in us and our self-identity goes from a limited individual consciousness to we start to see ourselves in everything. We start to see ourselves in nature. We start to see ourselves in other people. And actually everything is one expression, one being, one consciousness, one energy. And that's mm -hmm. what the masses have done for millennia. I do I, I do have my struggles with that I mean I love the idea that we're all one and there's this kind of unified consciousness and um, I, I love that idea but then if we are all one that means you know you and me James we're, we're one we're connected we're not 
two individual separate beings really were connected uh, and, and and don't mind that when it comes to you James but when it comes to like looking at some of you know like Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or something I'm not sure that I want to kind of really have that as as part of my oneness <laughs> <laughs> is 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 what's happening do you think in the world a reflection of some of the trauma and the limitations that we've ex we've experienced personally individual individually I'm, I'm kind of in this mindset of I'm an individual person I'm Amanda Joy I'm me there are you know my skin defines my barrier between me and the world and you know you know there's there's, there's a bit of me that is me and then there's a bit of me that, that the rest of it's not me and mm. that that kind of like that idea of that Shiva consciousness kind of like says no that that's just that's just part of the body and actually there's so much more we're all this we're all connected we're all one you are you are me and I am you and that means that there's there's elements of me <laughs> that I don't really want to have I don't really want to think about as being as elements of me do you think the fact that there's so much kind of dramatic change in the world and there is quite a lot of pain in the world do you feel that like that's a reflection of what's going on internally for us individually tell me a little bit more about that shiva consciousness and that oneness that idea of oneness and we are all one kind of being that is really important question and that is the big question and when we understand this non-duality it is mm -hmm. um it's a, an awakening in itself because it's not easy to to get what you're saying is all true and it's a paradox essentially this world of relativity world of manifestation the world of separation is true to an extent you are amanda joy i'm james gopala we're having our separate experiences and going on our own journeys and that is true and valid what they'd say in in Eastern traditions is it's not the absolute truth. So you will you will create it and you will cease to be, you know, to be that there's a, a life and death, but there's something that pervades everything that never changes. So that's the Shiva consciousness. Now again, you brought up a really good point there about this idea of collective consciousness, because we all share as a species a consciousness collectively. So we live in within a reality where um, what they would say is that actually physicality is an illusion, that it's just mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's going a little bit deeper, a little bit um, more into the, the deeper philosoph philosophical concepts. Um, it's basically, yeah, the idea that everything is, is one mind. Mm -hmm. Again, that's quite advanced, but if we, we look at what's happening on the get world... I like a bit of uh, Carl Jung every now and again, and he believes that there's this kind of collective unconscious part of the mind. And you can almost see that, you know, when, when somebody invents something here, quite often on the opposite side of the globe, that invention is occurring there as well and things seem to happen in sync um, and, and you can almost see patterns of, of progress and patterns of understanding developing around the globe all about the same time. So I can kind of like get this, the understanding of it and see how, how, how that works. But sorry, go on, tell me. Yeah, that's, 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 that's true. That's exactly it. So that's one way that we're connected mm. as, a, as a species. Mm. And the idea of things that are happening externally is simply a manifestation of what's happening internally, collectively. So what we see, we see a lot of polarity on the planet. We see blacks fighting whites. We see Democrats fighting Republicans. We see the East fighting the West. We see males fighting females. We see this, this polarity. Mm. Okay, and that's, that's a product of our of the way we think and the way we all are currently operating on the planet. We operate out of the brain, which is separated. You know, you have two hemispheres and that is essentially creating um, judgment, um, it, right and wrong, good or bad. It's duality. It's seeing separation. Like we're saying duality. So I am me and you are you and there's a clear separation. We're not anything. We don't have anything to do with each other. You know, there's absolute separation there. So mm. the thing is that it's a, it's a game, essentially, that the divine is playing with. It's using a force called Maya, and Maya is illusion. So 
our senses, of course, tell us we're all separate. That's what our senses say. That's what our eyes say. That's what, you know, all our different senses say. We see someone as being separate. We see someone as being different. So, of course, there's separation and duality. That's what our senses say. Mm -hmm. When we go into meditation and when we start to have spiritual experiences, we realize that this is just a projection of like a movie. And the, the actual foundation of like, if the light is being projected and the light is actually the, the foundation of reality, it's just, it's, it's, just, um, it's just a movie. It's a holographic manifestation of, it's like a drama, it's like a film but there is a foundational, fundamental energy that unifies everything. Now, we're starting to understand that a little bit in science, but you can only understand that if you do go into meditation or you, you have these mm -hmm. spiritual practices, because otherwise, you know, we're, we're in this place of illusion, which all the Indian traditions talk about, Maya. However, collectively, we are evolving. And so these things that we're dealing with inside this duality, this separation internally is being projected onto the world stage. So everything that happens on the world stage is just a sort of manifestation of what's happening, happening internally as a collective. So for example, take Donald Trump. There's a lot of people who have father issues, you know, and they're projecting those father issues onto Donald Trump. And some people just can't, absolutely can't stand them on. And, a lot of that is, you know, not completely, and I'm not going to kind of qualify his character, but certainly, you know, these father wounds are being projected and are manifesting as this, this man called Donald Trump. But it's just an expression of what's happening and what's going on deeply, internally, on a subconscious level, collectively. So all the madness that's going on, on the planet right now, with coronavirus, with the riots, you know, with everything, you could say it's like a purging of our subconscious collective mind and mm. hopefully it's bringing us to a place where we're less judgmental we're less um, caught up in separation and we start to see commonality in all people in all races in all religions which is the early stages of us collectively and individually starting to come into what we call unity consciousness, Christ consciousness, heart consciousness, where we move out of the brain, seeing everything as separation and duality, me and you, them and us. And we move into the heart, which is a unity consciousness, where we actually stop labeling and judging things. And we experience things just as they are without having to label and say, oh, that's good, or she's this, that, and he's that, and blah, blah, blah. We just experience life as it is without the labels. And essentially, then it's just pure experience, mm. and that's mm. blissful in nature. Yeah, fabulous. That makes sense. Let, yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I was having a little giggle to myself because yeah, I, I can see you a bit smirking there. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a bit of, I, have a, I have a bit of a crazy, uh, crazy sense of humour and a bad, uh, crazy imagination, and I was thinking, I wonder what what's going on in terms. Our two like kind of world leaders, Boris and and, and Trump, have both got crazy hairdos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, Born's I wonder crazy, if that's yeah. just like an expression of lockdown hair. <laughs> it's actually exactly. these random thoughts are a bit odd. But <laughs> anyway, let's talk a little bit more about healing and that evolution that you were talking about. And I know that through your uh, classes, your Hatha Yoga classes, you you really bring about healing and evolution through through working with the chakras. Um, and you were saying that, you know, some of our limitations in life, some of the things where the places where we're stuck or we've got pain or they've got we've got things going on could be as a result of trauma, could be a, as a result of our experiences and, and the limiting beliefs that we have. Tell me a little bit about how working with the chakras can bring about that healing healing that you were talking about and that evolution within ourselves that will 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 ultimately um have an impact on the collective consciousness i love that tell me a bit more about that healing and evolution so in tantra and hatha yoga there's a recognition of the subtle body the energy body okay so it focuses very much on the energies of the body as opposed to strong strict physical focus and practice now, the energy body is kind of the, the body that um, is the foundation of the physical body. So if you have an issue with your energy body, it's going to eventually manifest in the physical body. 
So the seven chakras essentially like the organs of the energy body. And chakra means wheel or vortex. So the idea concept is it's a spinning vortex wheel of energy that's found on the spine. Okay, and it's energetic. Also, there's this concept that of we are microcosmic replicas of the universe. So what you can find internally, you can find externally. And again, it's this idea that when you connect internally, you can connect to the universe. So this is a very important teaching of Tantra and Hatha Yoga. And so seven is a very sacred number, you know, seven days of the week, for example. Also seven colors of light, when light is uh, uh, refracted, you get the seven colors. So this basically is saying that we are beings of light, essentially, and that when light is refracted, you get seven colors, and they're the seven chakras. So the chakras are found on the spine, and physically, they correspond to the major nerve junctions on the spine. So we know that if we have spinal injury, or we have issues with the spine, it will impinge on the nerves. And the nerves, the different chakras or the different junctions of the nerves feed into different parts of the body. So for example, the root chakra is at the base of the spine and it works with four primary nerves, including the sciatic nerve. It goes all the way down into the feet. So in that respect, the root chakra, Muladhara, corresponds physically to the feet, to the legs, to the coccyx, sit bones. It also relates to the colon, bones, teeth, because it's the earth, uh, the earth chakra. It works with the earth element. So essentially what we do when we, on a physical level, realign our spine, we release compression on these nerve junctions, which allows the nerves to function properly and serve the different parts of the body. So sciatica is a very common issue. Tight glutes, pinches the nerve, you get pain going down the leg into the foot. So if we work to free up the compression in the lower part of the spine, then we're gonna free up the compression on the nerve and we're not gonna have those same, um, those pains and issues. It goes beyond just working with the nervous system. It works with the endocrinal system. It works with the whole body, the health of the whole body, because the chakra is the energetic organizer. It's the, the, the principle that organizes health and the intelligence of the body. Now, what occurs is through the past, through childhood, through when we are growing up, we might experience trauma. And a very common trauma for the root chakra is abandonment. Abandonment when we're young, we're a baby, you know, mummy or daddy isn't around, we feel that sense of loss. And this creates a memory in the subconscious, a program, an image that's trapped. And of course, with your hypnotherapy, you'd be very familiar with all of this. Mm. And so essentially that trauma, that memory is stored, if you like, in the chakra. And it blocks the free flow of energy. And the energy, again, the energy body is the foundation of the physical body. So if there's a block in the energy, eventually there's gonna be health issues. So say someone has experienced a lot of abandonment, maybe they're orphaned, or it could be anything, or just got a period where the parent wasn't around. Um, there's physical abuse, there's issues with money growing up, scarcity issues, abundance issues. These are all issues related to the root chakra. They may find they have real issues with the way they walk, with balancing, issues with the feet. Uh, issues with the legs, issues with the glutes, issues with the lower part of the spine, issues with the bones, issues with the teeth. So it's, and it also relates to the adrenal glands. So each chakra relates to one of the main endocrinal glands. So the idea is that, again, back to that body-mind connection, which is really the way I see Tantra, as you heal your body and you free up the energy and realign, you know, the body, you help to free up and release sort of the trauma that's stored in the subconscious and vice versa when you work on the subconscious through practices like hypnotherapy it has it has to have a knock-on effect physically as well so you probably see you know if someone has a strong treatment with you they might cry a lot and they might shiver and shake or something dramatic might happen and that is the way the body's releasing physically 
the chemicals that are trapped in the body, the trauma that's literally trapped in the body. So that's what I essentially encourage, not in all my yoga classes, but certainly I teach what's called chakra yoga, where we look at the chakras. And there are many ways you can balance and activate and heal the chakra. You can use meditation and visualization. That's a big part of Tantra. Mm. working with the physical postures that's a big part obviously so there's different ways obviously if you're working with yoga you're kind of limited within certain asanas but you can use mantras and visualizations and meditations and all these different things and also going into yoga nidra and that's very similar to hypnotherapy so you can go to the deeper levels where you work and go into the subconscious so that's what i'm encouraging i'm encouraging students to connect to the body see what they feel in the body any traumas, any aches, any pains, any health issues, and use them to go deep into the past to see why, especially if they're chronic issues. I mean, if it's just a little cold you get once a year, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. But if it's a reoccurring health issue, that suggests there's some karmic trauma, some, some memory, some trapped image in the subconscious that we're looking to release. And yoga is one of the ways that we can do that. I love it. It's incredible. I'm actually really excited about the fact that we can all get back to where our yoga studios and, and join uh, classes and, and get back to that lovely, those lovely communities that we get so many benefits just from meeting with each other, but meeting together and, and learning and, and, and sharing that spiritual journey with each other is just lovely. Now, I know that you, um, you do teach yoga in Harrogate at the Yorkshire um, Centre of Wellbeing, but you, you also work on online as well and I've, 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 I've seen a few of your YouTube videos just recently they look really really good James love them but how do how do people kind of like find you or join a class if they're not if they're not in Harrogate or if they are in Harrogate in the Harrogate area sure so we will be opening uh, in a couple of weeks which is great very excited for that yeah. so 27th of July and uh, so the main easiest way to contact us is through the Yorkshire Wellbeing website. So that's www.yorkshirewellbeing.co.uk. And there we have our timetable. And we are going to continue doing online classes as well as actual live classes. Because obviously some yeah. people may not feel comfortable coming back to class. But I think this whole uh, lockdown period has you know, learned a lot about social media and technology that we will bring in recorded classes you know, moving forwards because it, it really can help people who might not be able to make the, the actual class itself. So yeah, Yorkshire Centre for Wellbeing and Harriet, yorkshirewellbeing.co.uk. Um, it'd be lovely to, to hear from anyone who's, who, and then I've got on YouTube, Gopala Yoga. So Gopala is my spiritual name. And then I have my own sort of uh, channel there and put meditations and podcasts and things like that as well. I've been, I've been really enjoying your meditations. They're absolutely lovely and yeah, really, really gorgeous. And yeah, I absolutely love the way that you work. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you've got bits and pieces on YouTube because, you know, quite often it'll be really early in the morning for me when I'm doing a bit of practice or it might be sort of, a strange strange time in the afternoon because it fits in with my schedule and when it's there on youtube it's really accessible isn't it so is that gopala yoga we can find you on youtube that's right yeah gopala is g-o-p-a-l-a -A, gopala yoga so i have some yoga classes i talk about the chakras meditations podcasts um so yeah my goal again is to teach yoga in its original spiritual or tantric context, which includes all these different things for, for healing and expansion. Amazing. Thank you so much for welcome. being an amazing guest on the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. Do check out James's YouTube channels. Go and have a look at that website. Um, join in with some of these classes and expand your consciousness, grow your energy and uh, have a happier, healthier lifestyle. Um, James, thanks again for coming on. Uh, to this week's Wednesday Wellbeing Show, and it just leaves me to wish my uh, my viewers, my listeners, uh, my fabulous audience, an absolutely wonderful week of well-being. Have a great week, everyone! Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me, Amanda. Pleasure.